Welcome to the Electric Drum on 94.3 WYBC, the rhythm of the city. I'm your host, Jose Candelario, here, and I am speaking with this evening with Mr. Ty Sullivan, coach, West Haven High School men's basketball. Welcome aboard, coach. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, where are you from, Ty? From New Haven, Connecticut, born and raised, um, New Hallville, uh, Harden Place. That's where I was raised, where I was born. Um, so, yeah. I wasn't so, growing up in the Ville. Growing up in the Ville, um, it was probably one of the best experiences. Um, I got to see uh, pretty much everything. Uh, we grew up on a tight knit uh, street where your neighbors were your family members. Um, so if you were outside and you weren't doing something you were you were supposed to be doing, you know your neighbor, Miss uh, Miss Mabel next door, uh, Miss Angie down the street, Miss Farrell or Baba Joe will be able to say something as if they were your parents and kind of like hold you accountable. Um, we did things at night that like kids today didn't do. We we were outside, we played tag, we played two-hand touch on the streets. Um, we raced down the, down the street. So it was just a lot of childhood memories that um, I think helped propel me to to become an adult um, that I carry on to, 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 to this day. So I'm um, very appreciative of the time spent and the experience I had growing up in, in the Ville. And um, just, you know, and then the other side of it was the not so good side that um, your parents tried to keep you away from, but you knew that you knew it was there. So I learned how to kind of navigate through those things and and not associate with a lot of those things because I had different people in my life who went that way. And they were kind of like, uh, they helped me learn uh, what not to do. So um, you always knew that was there, but you also learned how to navigate through it. And you had those street smarts to know uh, where you didn't belong and where you should go. So um, I'm very appreciative of that experience. I think um, it helped me a lot even today. You know, so. Peer pressure is a lot. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's there's so many people that I grew up with that aren't here today um, that didn't have uh, the, the discipline or the structure or just that person in their ear telling them, hey, you shouldn't do that. Um, that isn't the right thing. And because, of, you know, it could be 30 seconds of your life. It, it could change your life, you know, or it could be a bad decision of smoking something you shouldn't smoke or drinking something you shouldn't drink. And that can have an, a lasting effect on your life. So I'm just very thankful that I have the people that, that were in my life, uh, the people who held me accountable early, that I didn't have to go through something like that. I was able to watch it and learn from it and, and not make those choices. Who were your influences growing up? You have, you have a mom, dad in the house? So growing up, I grew up uh, with both parents, my mom and dad, um, strong foundation. My father worked for the Housing Authority of New Haven. Um, before he uh, passed away uh, to colon cancer. I was at the age of seven when he passed away. My mother worked for uh, the telephone company. She cl she cleaned up buildings. She was pretty much like a custodian um, in those days where she worked downtown cleaning different buildings, AT&T and different uh, lawyer offices. Um, so they were like a hardworking, hard-knit family. You know, we had a strong foundation uh, growing up. My father was into real estate. He owned three houses on our street in Harden Place. Um, so he was like a, a well-loved community guy. And um, when he passed away, um, I have two older brothers and, and two sisters. So my older brothers, it was at that time where they were teenagers coming into their own. And um, at that time, they, that's when they needed my dad. And, you know, he passed away. So they started to dibble and dabble into things that, uh, you know, young guys start to, you know, be intrigued by in the streets. So they kind of made some mistakes early um, on that that were costly, where they had to, you know, do prison time. And for me, I was the young guy. I'm watching all this stuff. Um, I was too young to to kind of get involved in those things, but I was old enough to learn and see that those were things that I didn't want to do. So um, growing up, I didn't have my brothers in the house with me. I had my older sister and my younger sister. And my older sister, Tanya, kind of took me under her wing and kind of was like, nah, you're not doing this. Um, we would dance. We would, she would take me to the park to, to play sports. My older sister was kind of like that person that, that, that took me in and made sure I did right. You know, so I'm um, very thankful for her. I'm thankful for my brothers, too, because I learned a lot um, from them by some of the, the, the mistakes that they made. Um, we're very close now and they're both out of prison. Um, they're doing better, it's a work in progress. I'm there as a you know a resource and support for them. 
And I have my little sister who had me to kind of look at and 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 kind of model what she wanted to do with, with her life. So I've been kind of, you know, uh, a good example for her. And she's doing well. So um, our, our childhood was, was great. Like our father did all that he could to provide for us. My mother was a hardworking young uh, lady that did whatever she could. She raised five kids pretty much alone after my father passed. So um, I would say um, it was hard, but um, it, it wasn't it wasn't as bad as some situations. So um, I'm very thankful for that. You know? and you say your mom was a hard worker. Um, and she was out there doing the best she can for you. Yeah. Um, what what did what did you what values did you gain from watching her? Um, that there's no such thing as, as as it can't be done. You know, um, when doors are closed for you, you know, you find a way to open up another one. Um, she just refused to be, you know, to to take a no. So that's one of the things that that I learned from my mom. My mom's my hero. Uh, she showed what a strong uh, black woman is. You know, growing up. Uh, she 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 came from the South, Greenville, North Carolina. They migrated here with my grandmother. Uh, she has five sisters, two brothers, big family. Uh, grew up in Ashman Street Projects, uh, Eastern Circle. So they bounced around Franklin Street Projects, or you know, through growing up, a uh, big family in New Haven. And um, she just like she's my hero. So she was the first person that I was able to look up to and say, yo, she, you you inspired me to to just fight through tough times because she went through a stage where she was married to my dad who kind of took care of everything. And then when he died, we kind of lost everything. So I, I watched that process of her uh, having things and then losing things and then picking up the pieces and, and having it not affect us. We really didn't feel the effects of, of what she had to go through. So um, I admire that. And, and it taught me, uh, that was the first lesson I learned in providing and taking care of family putting family first so wow resilience yeah. right absolutely. Uh, absolutely one of the it's a virtues that's uh hard to instill in the youth yeah 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 to, especially today um you try to you know even working with kids you know i try to kind of instill that um tough times will happen it's about how you respond how you get through it you know so that's very important all right so you yeah. where you going elementary school elementary i went to uh, martin luther king mlk it was uh it's now Amistad, where Amistad is, on mm -hmm. Dixwell Avenue. Mm -hmm. I went to elementary school there. Um, some of the best years, man. Um, you know, it's where you, you learn how to interact. It's where you, where you meet your first friends. Um, some, some of those pe people that I met there are still my friends to this day. Uh, some of the people aren't with us anymore. Um, but you get your first piece of, like, interacting with different people. Uh, it could be people from your neighborhood that you never met that just live a few blocks down the street that you get to know and they come from a different place. So you learn a, a lot more about people and their circumstances, where they come from. You, you uh, learn to respect a different grind. So you think you have it bad and the people next door down the street, they, they don't have, you know, a loaf of bread. They don't have, you know, sugar or ketchup and you, you gain appreciation for the things that you do have. So uh, being a part of that, the, the elementary school piece is, you know, just learning more about different people in, in, in your area that come from different circumstances. Um, and from there, I went to uh, Sheridan Elementary School, uh, middle school. Um, and that's where, you know, it's another step and in, in to your development where now you're meeting, you're meeting girls, you're, you're, you're dating, you know, you're going through, through that stage. Uh, you're worrying about your parents, uh, how you're dressing. Um, and I was able to kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that my mom was able to still provide some of those things for me. Um, I've seen people that, who didn't come from what I, what I came from and didn't have the things that I have. And I was always, you know, kind to those people. So I learned to look at everybody with the, you know, with the same lens and, and respect everybody. And I was, you know, so I gained that kind of respect back from people in my community. And, um, and then you went to high school? High school, then I went to James Hill House High School. Uh, <laughs> the, the James Hill House High School. Uh, the, the greatest high school what uh, year? What year? ever. Uh, I graduated 2001, so I entered in 98. And um, that was just um, uh, another great experience. Um, coming in, so in middle school, I was a very good basketball player. Um, 
coming into high school. So I came in with a bit of popularity where I was hanging around some of the older guys. I got the experience. You know, I was like the, the cool young guy that hung around with the big brothers. So um, it was it was fun, man. It was a culture shock. Now you, you, you're seeing a lot of different things. Um, you learn who you are. You know, you learn what crowd to, to hang with, what crowd to stay away from. Um, I learned that being a good athlete and a good person to people, um, you get love from wherever you go, whether it's the street guys or, or the guys who aren't into those things. So I was able to navigate through the city without having any issues because people respected what I did on the basketball court and, and how, I, how I presented myself and how I respected other people. So I never had to worry about um, trying to be cool or trying to fit in. Um, I was just always myself, um, and I carried myself that way where I just respected others. And in return, I got that respect back. So, yeah. Very, very good. You're listening to the Electric Drum on 94.3 WYBC, the Rhythm of the City. Jose Candelario here with Ty Sullivan. Now, uh, you, you go, do you go to college? Yeah, so... Um, after uh, my senior year of high school, I uh, did a postgraduate year at the McDuffie School in Springfield, Massachusetts, where um, I went there to play basketball in, in Springfield to gain another year of experience to work on my body and also to improve my academics. So I went there and that's in the, uh, the NEPSAT conference, New England Prep School conference, where I had a great year there. And um, with that year, I was able to earn a scholarship to the University of Rhode Island. Um, in Atlantic 10. So, you know, coming from New Haven, I had scholarship offers from Central Connecticut, uh, Fairfield U, uh, St. Francis, PA, Manhattan, uh, that's a Central, Central Connecticut mm -hmm. State University, mm -hmm. um, a few Division IIs, uh, Quinny Piat, who was like, they, they wanted me bad. And um, I kind of didn't want to stay home. I wanted to, to get out and I knew I was a little bit better than some of the local schools at the time. And I wanted to gain a little more exposure. So we went for a prep school year. Um, that ended up working out for me where I was able to uh, go play in Atlantic 10 Conference. Mm -hmm. um, somebody at my size at the time, I was five, six, five, seven, hundred fifty 150 pounds. Um, it was kind of like unheard of, um, but it was possible. I just grew up with a chip on my shoulder. Um, because during that course of like the, the middle school, the high school, um, I had a bit of success, but I was still kind of overlooked. Um, I was always the guy that, you know, I got picked last, so I had to prove myself. You know, certain people didn't believe, so I had to kind of overcome those things and, and prove myself. So uh, getting the scholarship was something that was on my list, um, on my bucket list. And, and, and it was something that I attained, that I, uh, that I earned. And I felt good about um, and being the first person in my immediate family to, to go to college. Um, that was important to me because um, at, at the time I was the first person to get a high school diploma. So making my mom proud, being able to go do that first, get a high school diploma and then go on to college. She didn't have to pay a dime for it. Um, going in and getting my degree, playing basketball for four years. And um, making her proud, that was like one of the biggest accomplishments of my life, you know, um, as a young black man from the inner city, New Haven, Connecticut, um, plagued with a uh, bit of violence, um, drugs, different, different distractions. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to accomplish that. And I knew somebody like myself from my, my uh, circumstances, I was I'd be an inspiration for somebody else coming up. So I always carried that, um, carried that on my jacket. For, for kids coming up behind. Going to high school, college now in Rhode Island. That's a different transition too. It's a learning experience. Um, what lessons did you learn? Because you're, you're away, you, you're looking for tutelage or for some guidance and who was there for you? Oh yeah, so the first thing was it was a culture shock. Um, I'm leaving the city. Springfield helped me a little bit because it was a little diverse, but now I'm in the country. I'm in Kingston, Rhode Island. Um, and if you know anything about uh, Kingston, it's in the woods. So it's rural. So um, you see cows, you see dirt roads, you see um, it's, it's, it's not, nothing like the city. So um, it was slow pace. It was different. You see people that don't look like you. You see people that don't come from where you come from. So now you're, you're learning about different cultures and different, different people. Um, so it was a lesson in 
learn, learning new people. Um, I come in with from a faster pace. It helped me slow down. Academically, my first semester was terrible uh, because I get there. I'm in this big lecture hall, uh, 200 students. I'm taking anatomy because at first I wanted to be a gym teacher. So I, I didn't, all you know is in high school, you see the gym teacher, they're, they're having a bunch of fun. They're dressing how they want to dress. They're just kind of hanging out and chilling. You get there, you don't know you have to take all these sciences, anatomies, different things. And I'm like, what's this? So um, my very first class, we had like a test, 50 questions. It was like something they do as like an entry level type thing. And I'm like, what is this? I bombed it. Um, First semester, I was on academic probation, and uh, I remember getting called to my advisor and my coach at the time. He was like, man, look, you want to go back to New Haven? The rate you're going, man, we're going to send you back to New Haven, man, because you're not going to cut it. And it just brought me back to, like, New Haven and the people that came before me. I've seen it so many times where um, you hear the stories about you know, people coming back home or, or, or just it not working out. And I said, I cannot be that person. I do not want to be that person. I dedicated myself to the classroom. I worked my butt off. I read, I studied, I got help, I got tutors. Whatever I needed to do, I was not coming back home without my diploma. Like, I, so um, I buckled down, got it together, um, was able to start playing. I had an okay career. So, my career, why uh, basketball wise in college, wasn't uh, as great as it could have been. I could have went to a Quinnipiac and been the same level player that I was in high school, but I went to a larger, larger level, bigger level in the Atlantic Ten. So I had to make the adjustment of being the guy to being a role player. So I had to find an identity in college, and it was more of a defensive stopper, um, kind of a hustle guy. Uh, floor general type type thing. So that was my role. So that was the first time I had to learn how to accept a role, which helped me later on in life. So a lot of these things I felt like I had to go through in life prepared me for the man I am today and the positions that I hold today. So um, I finished there, uh, graduated uh, from URI with my degree in communications and sociology. Um, I knew at the time, um, I didn't want to pursue basketball overseas. I had a back injury my last year where I uh, herniated L4, L5 disc, very painful. So there was times where I had to miss a lot of practice. I had to miss a lot of time. I'm in and out. I could only play basketball for maybe four days straight before my back would go out. So it was something that was lingering. And I just knew at that time, look, I'm not going to pursue this any further. I know I could have. I was talented enough to do so. But I'm like, I know what I want to do. I want to coach. So um, one of my mentors growing up, uh, Kermit Carolina, who I kind of skipped through, um, he played a major part in my development through middle school, through high school. He was my middle school coach who uh, first introduced me to travel basketball, uh, where the first year I couldn't play because my mom wouldn't allow me my grades. And um, Kermit was like that, that role model in my life that kind of helped me see something different. Um, he was not going to let me fail. He was there. He showed up to teacher uh, meetings when my mom couldn't. He tutored me. He brought me sneakers. He taught me how to tie my first tie. He brought me to my first eighth grade formal. So he was that father figure in my life that kind of like helped me see that there was more to life than what I was, the, the path that I was going to follow. Because there was a point in elementary school where I shut down completely. I was dealing with the, the death of my father, a lot of different things. Um, making bad choices um, academically was just, it was, it was terrible. So Kermit was the person that kind of like helped me uh, get past a lot of that stuff and see the light, um, see a positive light. So I'm very thankful for him. And um, he was coaching at Hill House uh, when I graduated. So um, I reached out to him. He was like, hey, I have an opening on my coaching staff. But first, before I do that, I got to send you through a, a test run. I was a volunteer coach for about a year, um, coming off the 2006 state championship for Hill House with uh, guys like Mike Moore, Chaz McCarter. Um, 
I had to coach those guys in the summer league and fall league. So I'm up and down the highway with the defending state champs, taking them to different summer league and fall league games. I'm coaching them. I'm in the gym. I'm volunteering my time. I don't want anything for this. I just want to be around the game. I want to be around kids. I want to help them. I want to share my story. Hopefully it inspires them. So I really uh, enjoyed that, that time, like just really like doing something I love. I didn't want anything from it. The kids, they they kind of like soaked it all up like sponges. They loved to be around me. And then that following year, um, an opening was there and I was able to join the staff. And I was coaching there at Hill. I was from that time, 2007, all the way to 2018, where um, through that time, we won four state championships at Hill. I was, I was a part of four more state championships. Uh, numerous kids going to uh, college, whether it's division one, two or three, um different kids just that i've i've gained relationships with um over time that i still have relationships with so that was like a, a pretty big moment for me you know after college this is the electric drum on 94.3 wybc the rhythm of the city jose candelario here with ty sullivan hearing his track record his academic record and now his coaching resume how did you end up at west haven what were your challenges when you first got there and what was the learning that you had to do? Okay, so um, I remember it kind kind of vividly. Um, we had started an AAU program called SBA uh, Sullivan Basketball Academy, and um, I had recruited Kermit to come coach. I was still coaching at Hill House as an assistant coach, and um, we pretty much had our Hill House players we created an AAU team. And you can't really coaches can't really coach their players on the off season. So we had Kermit come and he was he uh he was the coach. I kind of ran the program as the program director. And on our way to, I think we were traveling to Pennsylvania. I'm in a car uh with my wife. Kermit's in the car behind us. We got kids in the car. We're traveling, and I get a phone call. Um, some things had transpired over at West Haven High where they were gonna make a coaching change. And I got a call from uh Miss Carol Brown, Carol E. Brown, who I love dearly. And uh Ms. Carol Brown said, Coach, we have an opening here at West Haven High School coming up, and you should be the coach. And I'm like, uh, I thought about being a head coach. Um, we're coming off of a championship run at Hill House. I'm feeling good. And she was like, hey, opportunities like this don't come up. I want you to be the coach. I think you should be the coach. I'm going to put your name in the hat. And I'm going to fight for you to be the next coach of West Haven uh, High School Basketball. What do you think? I said, Ms. Brown, uh, let me think about this. I, I'll give you a call uh, back. So um, I'm talking to Kermit. We're on the phone. And I'm like, what do you think? And he was like, this is the opportunity. You know, so I um, talked to my wife. She's in the call with me. I'm like, what do you think? She was like, you got to do this. It's a no-brainer. Like, you got you work so hard. Like, and at this time, I was kind of like burning out. I was kind of outgrowing the position that I was in as an assistant. I loved it. Loved the kids. I'm a Hill House guy to the bone. And um, it was just like something. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It's time. So I reached out to the staff, reached out to Coach Sutton and everybody. Everybody was real supportive. would be doing it. Um, reached back out to Miss Brown. I'm interested. So we go through the process of me applying, uh, me going through the uh, – it was just one interview. I interview with the uh, the principal, the athletic director, and superintendent. Right there on the spot, they was like, "You're the guy," and um, and from there, uh, it's been nothing but support from the administration. Uh, I want to thank Neil Cavalero, who's the superintendent. Uh, at the time, John Capone, who was the uh, athletic director. Right now, we have Mike Acolari, Joseph Morell, and I want to thank Dana Paredes, who's the uh, principal. She's at the time it was Pam Gardner, but she had passed away. And Dana took over, and Dana's been uh, very supportive uh, as well. But uh, Carol E. Brown played a major part in me being uh, the basketball coach at West Haven High. Um, the transition, uh, it wasn't that difficult because my first year, we kind of came in. The expectations weren't that high. They were, they came off pretty much the last two or three years before. They were like five win team. We come in my first year, we won 12 games. Uh, I won coach of the year in the conference. Um, and then that starts the trickle down effect of just kids wanting to 
come play at West Haven High. Kids wanting kids from West Haven wanting to stay in West Haven. So that was the main thing uh, getting there was keeping the kids that are from West Haven and West Haven. And then, um, you know, along the process, you deal with different things. So there were some difficulties there that we had to overcome, um, but um, nothing that we couldn't handle. And going into year three, we won our conference, we won our SEC conference. That was the first time ever West Haven High School has ever won the SEC uh, conference title. We did that. We were uh, 13 and one in the conference. It was the COVID year. Um, so it was a lot of success there, which brought more kids wanting to wanting to play and wanting to be a part of it. Um, for anybody who knew anything about West Haven basketball for years, there was only a JV and varsity level. Um, we didn't have a freshman program. When I came, that was one of the things that I wanted to bring in because there were so many kids that would miss out on being able to uh, participate in basketball. So they were able to give me a freshman program that we still have that kind of jump starts your development. So even if you're not as, as good as other players, you get to play freshman basketball and kind of develop your skills, then move on to JV and then varsity. So um, and then going into to this year, we had a, a historic year. Um, and we were two points away from winning our first uh, state championship. We haven't been there since 1987. So it was big. Uh, you know, I was four years old the, the last time that happened. And and being able to take these kids from where we started to get to all the way to the final, to really be in a position to win. Um, I'm still beating myself up a little bit about the game because it was just, you know, that Monday morning quarterback and you, you know, you you get there, you start to think about what you could have did, should have did differently. But um things happen. And I learned to uh, over time to not question things. Things happen for a reason. We were there and it didn't happen for a reason. But um, just that experience alone has made me a better coach already. It's like it started a fire in me, man, where I just want to get back at it and I want to get better. And I've learned from different choices and decisions that I made and in different times where I'll be prepared the next time I'm in that situation. And um like it's just it's it's gonna take me to an, another level of coaching. So um we're very happy to have gotten there. We, we did want to come back with it. We came a little short to a very, very good team. A team that was arguably arguably uh the best team in the state. And we pretty much had control of of the game for the most part. Um had them on the ropes. And you know, players make plays at the end of the game and, and you know they had a very, very good player who who made some tough plays. And they were able to uh, secure the win. So, you know, shout out to West Windsor High for uh, for for the, for the very, very good game that, that we played the other night. So, you know. I want to touch on a little bit, a little bit of uh, reaching children. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's, what's the magic? Well, um, I learned that um, every kid has has a carrot. And um, for me, early on, we used basketball as as the carrot to find out um, how we could help kids. We used sports and athletics to how we can how we can reach kids and help kids. Um, as I got older, and as we start to evolve, and different things start to happen, and I become a father, and I see the things that um, my son likes, I started to see that um, we have to do more than sports. Um, when reaching kids. So that's why I created a nonprofit called Ready Inc. Uh, Recreation, Education and Achievement for Disengaged Youth, where we try to tap into different things. We have programming from, uh, we got a program called Young Minds Making Money, where we teach financial literacy, teach kids how to create LLCs and nonprofits, create their own business businesses, where we have them do a pilot where they're uh, piloting their company on why we should like like a Shark Tank type of thing. We do yoga with the Elm City Yogis and uh, Bob Davis. We do uh, we brought in uh, co- construction workers to teach them that uh, that field. Uh, we bring in uh, police uh, officers, firefighters, EMTs. We try to expose them to a lot of different things and different programs. Um, so we wanted to touch everyone because sports. That's great. It can it can help you. It can help you secure scholarships. But sports, sometimes the ball stops bouncing. What are we going to do next? So we try to put emphasis on education and different programs. And um, I got into real estate 
over the last seven to eight years where I secured different properties myself. So I wanted to share that information with different kids. One of my friends and, and mentors, Daryl Hardy, um, I went to high school with him. Um, Daryl was my realtor where me and my wife purchased our first house. Um, he showed us how to how to flip the house and then buy another multifamily and then buy another family, an, another multifamily and then, you know, buy our dream house. So um, I was able to do a lot of that stuff within like five or six years through Daryl's like through his help and, and, and knowledge. And I try to share some of that with like some of my former students uh, and athletes who are like 18, 19. Like I wish I would have knew some of this stuff then. So um, how to sec- secure a home loan, you know, how to, you know, uh, find employment. So there's a, a lot of different things that I wanted to uh, tap into and, and teach kids early outside of sports. And then we also use, you know, sports as a carrot to, to kind of get their attention to to teach these other things. So um, getting kids early, building a foundation is very important. I think birth to three is very important. Uh and we're trying to instill programs now, birth to three, where we can help parents, single parents, single mothers uh, with with uh, home care, you know, uh, babysitting, things of that nature. And then going, you know, from th- three and up where we're uh, pretty much helping them, you know, with writing and reading. We do that in our basketball camp, uh, the Sullivan Basketball Academy camp that we do in New Haven. Um, we also have the West Haven basketball camp where every day when they come to camp, they have to bring a book. They have to read for an hour. They have to do a report, book report, and then kind of, you know, reflect on what they read. So we're trying to uh, build that foundation early with with kids uh, where they're reading, where they're writing, where they're being able to express and explain what they're reading, reading comprehension. And I think that's the the foundation to being a better uh, student. You're listening to the Elected Drum on 94.3 WYBC, the rhythm of the city. Jose Candelario here with Ty Sullivan, coach of West Haven High, runner-up in this year's state championship by two points. Uh, Before we go, what goes on during those timeouts, especially down down the stretch there? Well, um, in games like the other games, uh, like the last game, my assistants, who who are very very important, uh, Aaron Johnson, um, one of the best coaches around, Bobby Bynum, Keith Cothran, Christian Tillery, uh, Alvin De Silva, uh, Marquise Highslop. That's my coaching staff right there. I'm leaning on them for for things that I don't see, things I don't hear. Um, when I'm talking to the the team, I'm keeping them engaged. I'm keeping them confident. I'm telling them no matter what's going on, we're going to win this game. This is what we're doing. You're trying to explain. You only have a minute or two to kind of get your thoughts out there and make a quick decision. So you just want to put them in a position to uh, to make the right decision, to make the right choices. And I'm leaning on my assistants for, for different things that I don't see because there's a lot going on. You know, so your assistants are telling you, hey, this person has two fouls, three fouls. We only have one timeout. They're playing this type of defense. We need to get this mismatch. So there's a lot of things you have to cram in within a minute and a half and kind of get that message out there and and relay it to the kids and hope that they they execute it. So, you know, you hope that the time you spend in practice prepare you for for these moments, you know, where they can go out and execute whatever game plan you put out there or whatever message you want to get across in a 30 second or a minute, 30 second timeout. There you go. So, I mean, you, you preach and you lived preparedness and practice leads you to your opportunity preparation is everything you know so um you you try to mimic game like situations so in practice there's times we we call the situations where we went down seven at one point uh against windsor in the overtime and i seen it on my kids faces that they were kind of ready to tank out and i stopped them and i said look we practiced this moment right here so remember last week in practice we practiced being down five points with a minute and something left. We're going to win this game. We're going to go into 44. That's our full court man to man. I said, we're not going to foul. And we're going to come back. They're going to let us back in this game. And then their eyes got big. Like, oh, we did. And they went out there. And we started to come back. And and we were right there. We were a possession away from it. It was either a shot. Um, My point guard could have took the floater, but he chose to make the right play to drop it off to our big guy who, who missed the layup. But we were right there. 
and we came a, a possession short of of either winning or tying the game. So I was proud, you know, you know, because I had these guys early in the year where if that happened in December or January, we we would have quit. So I know we we've come a long way, and I'm like I said, I was able to walk out of the arena with my head held high. I was proud of those guys. They fought to the end. We coached to the end. And we just came up short, and you know I'll be back. You know, so <laughs> got a book here. How TJ made it, and you can too. You're an author. Yeah, they got a nice children's book uh, here. What what inspired you to to write? Um, this was really like a letter to to my son um, about my life. So um, I wasn't really able to kind of have that conversation with him uh, when I wrote it. He was a little younger. He was just coming into the age where he was learning to read. And I kind of wanted to uh, give him pretty much a, a, a visual of what daddy had to uh, do when he grew up, how, how life was growing up, um, learning about his uncles, learning about his grandfather, his, his grandma, and how we grew up uh, through a book and reading it. And it was kind of like him learning how to read as well. So uh, that's pretty much what inspired it. I was always, I always wanted to kind of tell my story. Um, because a lot of people don't know they, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a quiet guy. I'm kind of off to myself sometimes. I don't like attention. I like to kind of stay, stay to myself. So I was able, I was, it was a, it was from, it was me being able to, uh, share what I've had, had to deal with growing up. Um, little trauma, a little depression here. Um, and also letting kids know that it's okay. And this is how you overcome these things. And having a mentor in your life is 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 very important when doing it. So there you go. Yeah. How TJ made it, and you can too, by Tyree Sullivan. All right, it's a book out there to share with your young ones or your next generation or any generation, actually. Yes, yeah, you can. It's from from five year olds up. You can you can read that book and learn something. Any final words? Yes. Um. First, I want to thank. Uh, the city of New Haven and West Haven. Um, along this uh, championship run, you guys have gotten behind me, and I just wanted to let you know I appreciate the support and love. Uh, the town of West Haven, sorry we came up short, but um, I appreciate you guys uh, being there and supporting us. To all the youth out there, um, if you're dealing with any hard times, you're struggling with anything, um, you don't have to go through it alone. Reach out, find resources in your school, in your area, in your neighborhood. Tap into someone um, that you look up to. Ask questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question or a silly question. And um, keep trying. Don't quit. Just tell yourself, you know, you want to make it one more day. You want to make it to the next day. And continue to fight and follow your dreams, you know. And, and if you do the work, eventually good things will happen. So that's my message, you know, to the youth. This is Ty Sullivan, head coach of West Haven High School Basketball. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. This has been the Electric Drum on 94.3 WYBC, the rhythm of the city. I'm Jose Candelario, and like always, I appreciate and thank you for your listening.